good to be in God's house, and it's good to be saved. Praise Amen. God. It's just good to be saved. It's good to know that the devil has already been defeated. Yes. He was defeated before we even got saved. Praise God. But he's got to be defeated in our lives, too. Isn't that good tonight? And isn't that true? Can you say amen? amen. He's got to be defeated in our lives, too. All right. So to make sure we shake off that another Thursday night mentality. Amen. The devil's got to be defeated in our lives too. Amen. Only then can we say, I'm so glad Jesus set me free. Amen. Tonight we're in the book of Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18. We're glad for those of you online tonight. And if you're not here to give physically to the work of God, you can do so on the link in the description below. God bless you for your giving. We're glad you're here. Genesis 18. Genesis in the 18th chapter, and we're going to read, I'll, oftentimes we say this is a very familiar portion of scripture, and it usually is to church folk, most church folk, there are a lot of people who go to church and still don't know the Bible, but to most Bible reading church folks, it is familiar, but uh, we have to remember that not everyone knows as much as we know the Bible. And so may not be as familiar whenever we say that. So we'll say it's a very familiar, but we, ins we infer that to mean what? To those who already have been reading and things of that nature. But as a pastor and a teacher and just as Christians, we have to remember not everyone is as familiar with the Word of God. But tonight I believe that you're familiar with this portion. Genesis 18, verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Let's pray tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for this house of God. And thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you, God, that you would move in a special way. Father, that you would have your way, that Jesus would be glorified, that the Holy Spirit would move in our hearts, and that we would move a little closer unto you, as Abraham did unto you here in this Bible reading, that we would seek to move closer to you also. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In this setting, here in Genesis 18, most people would know, most people who read the Bible regularly would know that this is the time that God and two angels were on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah to find out, as God would say, if it is as bad there as I was told. 
Now, on the surface, when you read that, if you don't know about how God functions, you may read that and, re and wonder, what does he mean to see if it's as bad as he was told? First of all, who told him it was bad? The angels. Secondly, does he not believe his angels? And he's got these two angels. He's going to walk down there with them and make sure that, uh, that, uh, that Jim and Fred aren't lying again. All right? All right? Come here, boys. I'm going to, make, I'm going to find out if you're telling the truth this time. I know, I know how y'all almost got swept up with old Lucifer. So I don't trust you. No, that's not what God was doing. God, when God was doing this, he had two major purposes we know now. Number one, he wanted to impart something to Abraham, which we're going to talk about tonight. But secondly, God wanted to show mercy to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because though he obviously can believe his angels who were not going to lie to him, him going down there gave the opportunity for him to be among his creation, to put his own eyes on it before he makes the decision to, to uh, bring this horrific judgment that would eventually come upon them. God, though he does have to judge sin, only, wants to, only judges sinners when they choose to stay in their sin while he's judging the sin. Hence, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were judged with their sin. And also, God uh, is not willing that any should perish, the Bible says. And so he was wanting to go down there, uh, no doubt, to impart something to Abraham on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah. But as a show of mercy, maybe as a show of hope, that maybe if I give him just a little bit more time, let me just walk down there. Let me, let's walk a little bit slower because what I'm getting ready to have to do, I really don't want to have to do it. So God came down there just to see. Not, again, not that he didn't believe his angels. None of that. But God, I believe it was just a show of God's mercy. I believe it was just a show of God's mercy. So tonight we're in... Come on in, yes, you're good. Tonight we're in uh, Genesis 18. Okay, we're in Genesis chapter 18 tonight. And so Abraham, uh, is, is in, 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 at this part where we're preaching at, verse 22, Abraham is now talking to God. And he's about to have a discussion with the Lord. So Genesis 18 is where we are. And our title for tonight's message, Don't Be Afraid to Ask. Amen. Don't be afraid to ask. In this part of his life, Abraham had learned some things about God. And we're going to learn from Abraham what he learned about God. Through the experience of Abraham, <coughs> excuse me, through the experience of Abraham, and through the chutzpah of Abraham, chutzpah, Hebrew word there, meaning that, uh, that confidence, sometimes seemingly a confidence that is a little too confident, but that's what chutzpah is. But through the chutzpah and the experience of Abraham with God, we find out some liberating truths about God. Now, I preached, or rather, I taught on Tuesday night when we were talking about uh, was Abra or rather Noah and the ark and how everybody probably thought he was crazy until the water showed up. And how that a lot of people today would have, though we now know what happened in the days of Noah, the flood and how that Noah and his family were spared, because of social pressure, a lot of people today, if they would have been there, they would have not, they would not have gotten on the ark. Because they didn't want to look, they wouldn't have wanted to look stupid. Like Noah looked stupid until everyone was dead, and then he didn't worry about looking stupid because everyone's dead. Right? It's, it's kind of hard to look, feel like you're looking stupid when there's no one there to see you. <laughs> and so, but he had to endure that for about 120 years. Well, and here in uh, Abraham. Abraham shows us something that Noah showed us. And that is that it takes someone with some confidence and a little bit, not too much, but a little bit of, I don't care what anybody thinks. I care what God thinks. You know, a lot of that, but in the right way, I'll say it like this. A lot of that, but in the right way. Because you can have a mentality of, I don't care what anybody thinks, but you can go to an extreme with it, okay? And you can, you can kind of end up being the jerk of the group because I don't care what anybody thinks. Well, you've you got to care a little bit. 
but there's an element that you should not care, especially when it comes to obeying God. And so through people like Noah and people like Abraham, we're going to learn tonight here in Genesis uh, chapter 18, and really anybody else. It's those kind of people who teach other people certain things about God. Now, there are things that we would not know about God. These particular things we're going to talk about tonight. There are things that we would not know about God, at least not as far as we can understand, if Abraham had not done what he did here in Genesis 18. We would not know some things. And so what would we not know? First, we would not know that we can press God a little bit on some things. We can press him. Have you ever pressed on anybody for an answer? And you had to push a little bit harder to get an answer from them? And then finally they gave you an answer? Maybe they either didn't want to, or they were too busy, or just no one asked them. And so finally, crazy looking you stepped out there and said, I gotta ask this question. And everybody else got the answer because you asked the question. Well, there is room for that, and the Christian really is supposed to live like that. Christians in this world are supposed to live on the edge in a healthy way. And when I say the edge, what I mean is walking according to knowledge and faith in God, that in his word that it shows us certain things that the rest of society cannot understand, the Bible says, because their minds are blind. Society will spend billions of dollars to go out in space when the Word tells us all kinds of things about God's creation. And all they would have had to do is give me the million dollars and I would have told them. <laughs> but they didn't. They want to build their rockets and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm all about science and exp exploration and God put it into our hearts to go and explore this creation he gave, that He made and put us into. But there are answers in God's Word that if we would just take it as it is, we could know a whole lot more than we tend to know. Well, some things we know about God, the big picture thing first, before I start get, getting into the details, is that you can press God on certain issues, and he will not judge you and throw you into hell. You can literally ask God questions. You can ask God why. You can ask God if he would be willing to do this. You can ask God to open doors of opportunity or close doors of trouble and curse upon your life. Even the Lord himself says in Revelation chapter 1, chapters 1 and 2, I open a door that no man can shut and I close a door that no man can open. So God is okay with his people kind of leaning on him about certain things. Now people might not always be okay with that. People sometimes, if you press on them a little bit to get an answer from them, sometimes they get offended. I'll tell you when I'm ready. Well, I need to know, okay, so that I can get this accomplished. But what that's, before, without getting too deep into the psychological weeds there, a lot of times people guard information because it's a control issue, because they have fear that they're going to lose what they have because they don't see themselves as having a lot. But when you, have, when you see yourself as being a person of abundance, you're not afraid to teach other people because you look at yourself as a fountain rather than a swamp. Amen. And so, but when people look at themselves as a swamp, they try to keep it all to themselves because they're afraid of losing control. Information and language is a big thing. Okay? It's a big thing with people. All right, enough of that. You didn't come here tonight for that type of teaching. And, uh, from Abraham, we learn that you can press God. And so tonight's title is Don't Be Afraid to Ask. Amen. Don't be afraid. Now, right from the start, the Christian's mentality is this. We can ask God, but we leave it in God's hands to do something or not do something. Okay? We let him decide yes or no. We let him decide when. We let him decide how. We let him decide if it even happens at all. And so we have to realize that God is merciful and he lets us have a relationship with him like that. But we must recognize that he is God and not us. That's what the psalmist wrote. He's, he made us. We did not make ourselves. So when someone says, I'm a self-made man, no, you're not. Self-made woman, no, you're not. Because you wouldn't even be able to wake up if God didn't allow it. And so we have to realize that God lets us ask him things. God lets us talk to him. God lets us press him on certain issues. But at the end of the day, we have to say, but God is still the final decision maker. When you can live like that, you're going to be the happiest person in your life. 
because you're not tied to an outcome anymore. You are understanding that whatever God allows is going to work together for the best. And that's the happiest person right there. The person who's always trying to control an outcome, never happy. They're never happy. Abraham, we're going to learn here, he was asking for a certain outcome, but he let God decide the outcome. Don't be afraid to ask. Number one, don't be afraid to ask for God's mercy. Genesis 18, verse 22. Genesis 18, verse 22. Don't be afraid to ask for God's mercy. And the men turned their faces from this and went towards Sodom. Now, as I said earlier, explained a little bit earlier. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities. The Bible calls them the cities of the plains. Because they're out in, they were out in the flatlands, kind of like Kansas and all that area in the Midwest of America. Just straight, flat, nothing but corn. And so they were the cities of the plains, two of five major cities. And... God had heard about the wickedness of these two cities. Most people have heard about Sodom and Gomorrah. We understand that. We're not teaching about that so much. But God was on his way there to see the, to see the cities, to see if it was as bad as he had heard from his angels. And he stops and he talks to Abraham while he's en route to these cities. And God has two angels with him. These two angels turned and, and left and kept going. And Abraham stayed there and talked with the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, God appeared to people differently than he appears now. We're told in the New Testament that God, who used to speak a certain way in the Old Testament, now speaks to us through his son, Christ Jesus. And so the way he does that is through the word of God, the Bible, through preachers and ministers, and in our own hearts. In our own hearts. If you ever felt that conviction about something that's wrong, that you feel is wrong, or that you may have learned it to be wrong, and now you, you have to make a decision, that's God talking to you. That's how he speaks to us today. But here, he would speak to people face to face. And so God is standing there with Abraham here in Genesis 18, verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? Now, what was Abraham's vested interest in sparing this city? His nephew named Lot was in that city. And so he pro I'm sure he cared more about Lot than most everybody else in that city because that's just how we are. We care more about family members than usually everybody else. But he started off talking to God like he was caring about all 50 people. But Abraham, really, we could kind of tell he just cared about Lot. <laughs> now, I think he cared about everybody. Don't misunderstand. I believe he cared about the entire city. But he was really thinking about his nephew, Lot. Okay, that's really what was going on here. But he didn't want to come across like that. He didn't want to say, well, can you at least get my nephew out of there? He didn't say, because that sounds kind of bad, doesn't it? I mean, you're a man of God. God has told you he's going to build an entire nation out of you. Well, uh, everybody else, yeah, whatever. And I don't like those neighbors anyway. But can you get my nephew out? That sounds kind of bad, doesn't it? So he kind of puts a little gloss on it. What, what about 50 people, Lord? I care. 50 people. People I don't even know. I don't even know them. Got 50 people. Will you destroy an entire city if you can find 50 people that are righteous? Verse uh, 25. Actually, verse 24. Peradventure, there be 50 righteous in the city. Will you destroy the city for 50? Okay, verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Look what he's telling God. That's something you don't do, God. You don't destroy righteous people. That's far away from you. That the feet that, that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now Abraham's got a little bit of a spine in him, doesn't he? He's talking to God like this. Like, aren't, aren't you the judge of the earth? Aren't you the, uh, the judge of all the earth? Aren't you supposed to be the one who does right? He's getting kind of bold. But God's okay with that. 
See, Abraham wasn't doing this from a place of disrespect. And there's the difference right there. There's the difference right there. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He says there at the end of verse 25. Now you can take that and with a different attitude and different intonations, make it sound either disrespectful or respectful. I mean, if you were to say something like, uh, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Uh, like that, that sounds disrespectful, doesn't it? But if he were to say, but shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That sounds more like he's pleading with God, talking to God respectfully. Verse 26, and the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Now look at that. God was willing to not destroy an entire city if he could just get 50 people who were fearing God. That's pretty powerful. That's the size of one regular-sized church. Yeah, that's the size of one regular-sized church. If he can find one church that will pray for a city and live right themselves, then God will spare an entire city of hundreds of thousands of people and keep drawing people and not judge them. So immediately we see that Abraham's requests were just that, request. What do we learn from that? We do not demand anything from God because he's God. I mean, when somebody can just close their hand and you die, that's pretty powerful. Yes, sir. All right? I'm, I'm talking about even more than Marvel Comics and all that, cra and all that crazy stuff, all right? The Bible says, that, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I don't really, I'm not really a fan of Marvel Comics because Jesus says, Marvel not, in John chapter 3. <laughs> Little joke there, don't worry about it. They didn't have Marvel comics back in the days when Jesus was on the earth. Don't worry. What I'm saying is God is more powerful than any of the other comic characters, all right? When someone can close their hand and you die, that's pretty powerful. So what we're learning from Abraham is that we don't demand anything from God, but we can request things from God. We can request things from God. Pastor Fulmer, if I read Marvel Comics, am I going to hell? I didn't say that. I'm just trying to tell the joke. Man. <laughs> he was not demanding anything from God. But God is merciful and God loves us to the point where he will let us actually talk to him. Make a request. Also, Abraham's desires were not for more money. He was praying for others. He was praying for others. Whenever God sees men and women who will pray for the good of others, then God will also give us the desires of our hearts. Because when we're praying for others, we're praying like the Lord prays. Because he prays for others. And so when we begin to pray like the Lord prays, we begin to get, we get the desires of the Lord also. And when God sees you having the same desires in your heart as he has, then he's far more likely to answer your prayers. When our requests are more geared toward others than ourselves, we'll find God's mercy will cover them and us. Matthew 6, says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. The things that people pray for, God give me this and God give me that. He said, if you just seek God's ways of doing things and learn to conform to God's ways, to the power of God, he'll not only enrich you in your heart to where you will actually be happy in your life, but he'll add all this other stuff that you've been praying about. Amen. Amen. Solomon found this out also, 1 Kings chapter 3, when the Lord asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, give your servant understanding that I can lead your people <clears throat> an understanding heart. And the Lord would tell him, because you didn't ask, for mo ask me for money, because you didn't ask me, ask me to uh, give you victory over your enemies, because you didn't ask me for more land, I'll give you what you've asked for, wisdom and understanding, so that you can be an effective leader, 
and I'll give you money, and I'll give you land, and I'll give you victory over all your enemies. Yeah. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. All right. Don't be afraid to ask for God's mercy. What did Abraham say? 50 people, Lord. 50 people. The odds, you would think, would be in his favor. Next, don't be afraid to ask God to adjust his immediate plans. Back in Genesis 18, verse 27. Don't be afraid to ask God to adjust his immediate plans. Verse 27 of Genesis 18. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. So that's how you know that he was coming from the right place. He was coming from a respectful place. Lord, I've already opened my mouth. Don't judge me. Don't kill me. I know I've already settled. I've already, I've already pushed you a little bit. He said, I'm, dust, I'm just dust and ashes. He said there in verse 27. Verse 28. Perhaps, or peradventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? So what are we down to? What's fifty minus five? Forty-five, right? And he said, God said, if I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. Look at God. He's changing his immediate plan. God is not like some insecure people. I said 50, you better do what I say. Or Article 15 for you, all right? That's not the way God operates. The way people think God operates is, I said it, that's it. If you, uh, if you ask about it, I'm going to throw you in hell right now. That's not the way God operates. That might be the way false religions gods operate, and sometimes they name their God Jesus. There's a lot of people who say their God's name is Jesus. He died on a cross, but he has no power to give them victory in their lives. The God of the Bible has power to give you victory, and the God of the Bible will let you talk to him. Not the man, but talk to him from a respectful place because he is God. So God said, I won't destroy for 45 if there's 45 people who want to live for God. Verse 29. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. What is God after? Is God after being the big man on campus? Whenever I say go, don't even try to talk me out of it. No, God, God's secure. He knows who he is. Amen. God knows who he is. He is not insecure. He doesn't need people buttering him up to make him feel good about himself. He knows he's God. He knows he's God. And when there's just something about knowing who you are and what role you serve and your position and just embracing that. There's just something about embracing who you are, what you are, your title, your rank, your position, the responsibility that you've been given that people can't shake you. Amen. People can't shake you. Amen. They can't shake you. I'll give you an, il an illustration right here. Back in my military days years ago. I worked at the PAC office, IPAC, we called it, there in Okinawa, Japan. IPAC, that's the Personnel Administration Center where we do all kinds of, you know, personnel stuff. And one of the jobs we did was travel claims for people who would go TDY, they'd come back, they would give us their receipts for their hotels, their rental cars, rental car fuel, whatever, whatever, when they want to claim it so they can get reimbursements. And sometimes, those who have been around the military for a while, like O5s and O6s and E8s and E9s, who know how to work the system, will try to slip a few extra receipts in there. They weren't supposed to slip in there. Because you're, you're only supposed like, if you give a bagger, a bag carrier at the hotel a tip, you only, can only claim tips up to like 50 bucks. They would be trying to claim like 80 or $100 in tips. Sir, you can't do that. Well, my last unit, well, sir, you can't do that. The travel regulation states that you can't do that. And the travel regulation, you don't say this part, but you just know this part because you have to be respectful. The travel regulation outranks the highest O-10 in any military service because it's a federal thing. Not, it's not just military. And so here I am in E-3, E-4, telling, this o, you know, telling these E-8s and E-9s and O-5s, no, we're not going to do that, sir. Not, not in a bad way, you know, respectfully, right, because you can get nailed. But, sir, we can't do that. Well, 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 sir, I'm sorry. We can, well, I, can, you, I can refer you to my E6. He's going to refer you to my chief warrant officer. He's going to refer you to my chief warrant officer three. And he's going to, he's the top guy, so he's, he's going to tell you no. But it does like, no. And one thing that our leadership taught us, as long as you are right in the right way, then no one can tell you you're wrong. Amen. 
And this is in a leadership class tonight, but that's just part of it. If you're right in the right way, no one can tell you you're wrong. All right. So God, Abraham was talking to God. 40 people. It's kind of like a reverse auction, right? You know, they're like, oh, looking for 30, 30, I'm looking for 40, 40, uh, 45, 45, we'll get a 45, how about 50? He's going, Abraham's like, uh, 50, 50, uh, 50, how about 45, 45, can I get a 40, can I get a 40? <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask God to adjust his immediate plans. Now, one plan God will never adjust, his eternal plan. It's already written in the Bible. God's going to, God is going to judge the unrighteous. He's going to purify the world by fire. He's going to bring down his heavenly city out of heaven and forever will be with God here back on the earth without sin in the earth. That's not changing. Amen. That is not changing. And that's a super big picture of everything. But God will change his immediate plans. We see it right here. And so Abraham is saying, what about 45? I, I won't judge him for 45. What about 40? Uh, yeah, I won't judge him for 40. Because what is God looking for? To be the big dog? No. He's just looking for somebody who will care for somebody else. That's what God's looking for. Somebody who will have the spine to address him and talk to him, though he is God, to talk to him about business. The business of souls. Some people will never be able to converse about anything other than brownies, their favorite hairstyle, and their selfies on Facebook or Instagram. That's all they can talk about. If you're ever around them, that's all, you t that's all they talk about is nothing. God's looking for people who will converse with him about serious business. Question tonight. If God were looking for 50 righteous in this city, would we be among them? Or would we be a reason our city got destroyed like Sodom? Because we already know the end from the beginning, don't we? We already know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. There were not even 40. There were not even 30. There were not even 20. There were not even 10 righteous there. God had to destroy the city. Question. Would we have been among the 50 righteous? It's a good question, isn't it? Let's keep going. Ezekiel 22 and 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. And he would go on and say, but I found none. I found none. What's God looking for? He's looking to save people from their sins and then empower them. Unlike what society says about God, unlike what society says about God, when you get saved, God doesn't start treating you like some kind of second-rate slave. He empowers you because you are his child. He adopts you. Amen. Faith in Christ makes you an adopted child of God. Right. And God does not treat us unequally. God treats us fairly. And so therefore, when we are his children, he begins to empower us with knowledge, power and victory over sin, etc. So in Ezekiel, God said, I was looking for somebody who would stand between me and my judgment. And nobody would be there. Nobody. Oftentimes we complain about things, but we don't want to be the answer to things. We don't want to be the solution. God is saying, if I can find someone who's willing to be the solution, then a lot of the problems will disappear. A lot of the problems will disappear. So secondly, we've talked about what? Don't be afraid to ask God to adjust his immediate plans. And finally, don't be afraid to ask for more. Don't be afraid to ask for more. Verse 30. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. You can kind of feel what he's going through, right? Man, I've already talked God down. All right, from 50. Peradventure there shall be 30 be found there. There shall 30 be found there. He said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. Man, when the, hey, when the, when the Lord's blessing, keep going, right? <laughs> keep asking. He said, What about twenty? He said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. Now, God, I've not, I've not talked to God face to face like Abraham did. 
But I don't think God, because God's a very relevant God, he's a very personable God. You ever met someone who's not personable? I mean, they look a statue, you try to talk to them, and they're just like staring into who knows where. You know, all right? Personable people are cool to be around because they talk to you like a person. They're, they have emotion. They talk to you. They, they have a little passion in them. I don't believe God was like, I will not destroy it for 20's sake. Eh, I don't think so. Imagine this dialogue back and forth. Lord, what about 50? I won't destroy it for 50's sake. Lord, uh, don't destroy me. What about 40? No, 40. I, I won't destroy it for 40's sake. All right, well, God, you know, I've already talked once or twice. Now, what about 30? Uh, I won't destroy it for 30's sake. Okay, well, Lord, you know, just don't, don't, don't get mad at me. This, this is what he's saying here. Don't get mad at me. What, what about 20? I want the story for 20's sake. It's like, come on. What you got, Abraham? How much faith do you have? I want 30. No, go ahead. What else? Come on. Come on. Come on, Abraham. Okay, well, what about 20? I want the story for 20's sake. Come on. You know the next number now. Come on. <laughs> it's, like, it's like God is trying to encourage him. Have some faith. Come on. Step out here with me. Come on. Step out here with me. Didn't Jesus call Peter out of the boat there in the Gospels? Get out on the boat, walk on the water? Come on. And so, it's like God is saying, come on, what, what else? You want to go to 10? I can go to 10. <laughs> Let not the Lord be angry. What about, and then at the, there in verse 32, 10 shall be found there. What of 10? He said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. 10. That doesn't sound like a God who wants to judge people to me. That does not sound like a God who's hateful and angry and mean and bigoted. That sounds like a God who says, look, anybody who's willing to ask and believe, I'm willing to bless. But we don't get what we don't get, oftentimes because the book of James tells us, because we just don't ask. Verse 33. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Why didn't Abraham go to five? I don't know. Maybe he felt... That 10, that he had pushed it all the way to 10. And maybe he felt, and I can't ask for five. I can't ask for five. Would God have, would God have uh, spared judgment for five? I believe he would have. I believe he would have. But we, don't, but we find here that Abraham stopped at 10. Don't be afraid to ask for more. Question, question askers tend to get in trouble sometimes. Tend to get in trouble sometimes. Because question askers rock the boat a little bit and they come across like either they don't believe you or they think they know a better way. That's the way they come across. And sometimes they do. And you can pick up when someone's just, a, just an idiot. You know, you can pick up on that. But when someone is sincere, we have to learn how to be like God and give them an opportunity to be sincere. If we treat everyone like they're out to get us and like they're trying to attack us, we're the ones with the problem. Because not everyone is. God shows us this. God shows us what it's like to trust people having good intentions. So we can't just assume people are out to get us. They may not be. And so question askers tend to get in trouble because they come across like, I don't believe you or I know a better way because I'm smarter than you. Which is, that might not be the case. They may just be trying to find out what the best way is. And they may not know. Abraham was asking God for more by asking God for less. In this case, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. But what he was asking God for more of was more mercy. More mercy. Amen. Asking for more when it's for a righteous purpose and not a selfish or sinful purpose is more likely to get granted by God than you might think. God is in the prayer answering business, but sometimes we don't pray. That's why we don't get, or when we do pray, it's either sinful and God's just not going to give it to us, or we want it for our glory and not to help and give glory to God. If what we pray for is meant to be a blessing and to bring glory to God, then God is more likely to give it. How do I get this? How do I get to this place? Psalm 37 verses 4 and 5. If you come on to the music, please. Psalms 37, verses 4 and 5. Delight thyself also in the Lord. If we hate serving God, we're probably not going to get our prayers answered. 
Because God is a good parent and he doesn't always give rewards to his spoiled children. So if we have a spoiled brat attitude with God, we're probably not going to get anything except a, 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 except a, a spanking and sent to our room. <laughs> the Bible says that in Hebrews. And so I almost said whooping because I'm from Alabama. All right, we get, a, we get a whooping and sent to our room. How about that? But he said, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Some people think that means that God will give them whatever they want. That's not what he said. He will give you the desires of your heart. Because when you start delighting in God, he shares with you his desires. And when you pray from God's desires, he's going to answer it. The problem is we don't get that far. The book of James tells us that the prayer of a righteous man, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, sometimes people are not living righteously. you got to live right. You want answers from God, you got to live right. And you can't live right unless you're saved. Religion ain't going to do it. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him. He'll bring it to pass. That's what, Psalm, that's what Psalm 37 says. Oftentimes, people don't live for God because they just don't trust God. They don't trust God. They don't trust that God's righteous ways are the best ways. They believe that the ways that everyone else is living is the best way. It is not. That's why they come back broke. That's why they come back with STDs. That's why they get Article 15s. Because their way is not the best way. And you may walk alone because the crowd usually is wrong. 95% of people are just following the person in front of them wherever that leads. They don't know. But if you're willing to be part of that 5% who just walks with the Lord and walks alone sometimes, even if you're the only one, you're the one who gets the blessing. God blesses those who can walk with Him on their own. But you can't do that unless you accept Jesus Christ. Salvation is the only way to please God and to be able to stand with God. Let's bow our heads tonight. Let's close our eyes. And if you need to get saved... Or commit your life to God, as the Bible says. I want you to pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I ask you to save me and cleanse me and forgive me. I want to walk with you. I want to be accepted with you. I'm done with this world. I ask you to accept me, and I accept you. And I'll commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible teaches if you did that with a sincere heart, you're saved. You need to start walking with God. You need to start walking with God. Even if no one else joins you, God says, start walking with me. Because I'll show you the right way. Tonight, the altar is open for prayer. If you'd like to find a place to pray, you can come up and pray. We're going to spend some time in God's presence here in prayer. Now it's your opportunity to talk to God. Whatever's on your heart, this is your time to be like Abraham. And talk to God directly. She sings for the Lord. Let's find a place to pray. God bless you tonight. Amen. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Why alone, others thou art calling? 
Amen. We can learn some things about God from Abraham. Abraham, he was respectful, but he kept asking God. He kept asking God. But we learn from Abraham, what did he do? He allowed God to decide whether he would do it or not. Once we can get that, that's what sets us free. Because expectation is the root of disappointment. Expectation. Things have to be a certain way. Once we get past that and we just let God direct our paths and let God make the decisions, we can pray, we can bring our petitions, but let him decide. That'll set you free from a lot of things right there. Tonight, let's all stand as we prepare to dismiss in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the service. We ask you to bless in a very special way as we continue on in our lives. We ask you, God, to just bless us as we depart from this place and bring us back safely to your house on Saturday night at 6.30 as we prepare to worship God this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.